Let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, by your word, you created the heavens and the earth that all and all things in the universe. That word became flesh when Jesus came into the world to be our saviour. And now as we study your word, we ask that you, your Holy Spirit would work in our lives, in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our speaking, in our listening. That you would make Jesus manifest to us, strengthening our faith and conforming us more and more to your will. As we ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now before we read uh, <clears throat> read on um, from verse um, 6, uh, from the beginning of the second day of uh, creation, uh, the question was asked last time, which um, I thought that I had answered, but apparently I hadn't, so I'll answer it now. And the question had to do with what the nature of the light was uh, that was created on the first day, <clears throat> uh, especially as we will hopefully uh, hear later on today, uh, the sun, moon and the stars were created on the fourth day. There have been all kinds of different answers to this. <clears throat> um, and they partly reflect the way that different people have understood the uh, four day, uh, sorry, the six days rather of creation uh, and, and, and how they take them. So one view, which goes back centuries in some of the reformers, Certainly, uh, John Calvin held this view, for example, that the sun, uh, the the uh, that when God created the heavens and the earth, at the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, if you like, entirely. But what happens over the six days of creation is that the, uh, if you like, different things come to fruition or completion. So God created everything at the beginning, which is a bit like what I told you that St. Augustine said, you know, God created instantly. But not everything was completed immediately. So uh, hence we get uh, light and darkness on day one, but then sun, moon and stars on the fourth day, which is when their creation became complete. Um, <clears throat> uh, other other views uh, on, on this are that uh, there's, a, if like those, but this is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful in what I say, so it's not to be misunderstood, but if you like, it's almost... Not metaphorical, that would be too strong a word, but if you like, that the, the distinction of light and darkness was there at the very beginning. And it kind of points to the uh, the battle, if you like, that later on emerges with the fall or between light and darkness, if you like, the, the, the distinction between light and darkness um, is, is there at the beginning. And then the actual, the light that shines on the earth, if you like, from the sun, moon and the stars, that comes and day four that has some difficulties of course because we already have uh plants uh that are created on day three <clears throat> and it's very difficult to imagine photosynthesis in plants without uh sun moon and the uh, at least in the light of the sun um the these are these are so some of some of the ideas have been uh, have been uh, proposed uh, another idea, which again, it really links to the fourth day more, is that the, uh, if you like, the sun, one, one suggestion is the sun, moon and the stars and everything that in, in all the kind of celestial bodies were created at the beginning, but at the very big, in the very beginning, they were, they were sort of invisible on earth because of some, you know, the kind of, there's some sort of mist in the air or something like that. So they, and, and then if you like day four, they became apparent or visible. <coughs> The difficulty with that is, of course, that uh, we are told that God made them on the fourth day uh, rather than that they were revealed on the fourth day. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have a very strong personal view on this one way or another, but uh, of course we can, we can sort of uh, point out, first of all, that uh, and if, if we if you look at it from uh, through modern lenses, uh, which is what we have, you know, our knowledge of the universe and galaxies and all that kind of business, and of course what we see as sun, the sun, moon, and you know the sun, our nearest star, uh, and the moon, are, you know, and, and then the stars in the sky. What we see in the sky is just a fraction of what's actually there. So there, you know, there's plenty of uh, there, you know, there's plenty of sources of light if you like. 
that are way beyond <clears throat> what's visible on Earth. So they were, you know, they feel like the existence of light uh, doesn't depend. The existence of light as at all doesn't depend on there being any light on Earth. That's the first point to make. I think you know you, you can have light which is not visible to us because it does exist. Um, and you know the things that we are now able to see were only visible. You know there are some things that we are only have been only visible to the the Earth for the last ten or twenty years because of technology, and of course before the making of the teles you know first telescopes in the in the sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, 15, 16, 17 centuries, most things that we know that are out there were just not visible. You know, people people just didn't couldn't see as far as we we can now see, and this was written obviously well before there was any such thing. Um, so so you feel like that those are sort of ways of 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 understanding what is meant by light in a sort of very uh, natural way. I don't know if that answer uh, you you will have noticed that I haven't given you a very clear answer. This is what it means, uh, and the very simple reason is that I don't really know. But those are some suggestions that are out there. I didn't think, Pai, if you asked that question, I don't know if that's at all helpful. Mm, no, <laughs> <laughs> not, really, not really. I mean, I asked you that could it have been um, so electromagnetic radiation? Because at some point God had to make that uh, before he made everything else, because all those uh, um, rules had to be there mm. for everything else. So. Uh, <clears throat> And that is, uh, I mean, the so visible light we can see, it's only a small part of that radiation. Then there's uh, gamma rays and uh, radio um, uh, waves and, and so on. And mm. when did God make all those? Well, I mean, they, they all have a source within the universe. You know, so much of the electromagnetic radiation that hits the Earth, much of it comes from the sun, hence light and UV and infrared and all this other thing, gamma rays and, and beta rays and so on. Um, and the rest come from somewhere else in the universe. They don't just exist. They don't just, they don't emanate in themselves. I mean, modern, modern physics talks about energy as being kind of indestructible. Energy is not, you know, energy in the universe is not destroyed or, or, you know, you don't add to it or take away from it, but rather you just try, you know, you change, change it from one form to another and hence E mm. equals MC squared and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> The difficult with all these questions is that Genesis one doesn't care one way or another. It's not interested in that because that whole discourse was not there. And those questions were not in the mind of the human author, and they were not written to give us, you know, to, to, to the, they, the Genesis was not written so that twenty first century people could uh, equate the uh, account of creation with what they just discovered in the last hundred two hundred years about physics that's the difficulty so you know the, the, we can't give on that level i don't think we can give a very satisfactory answer because we are asking questions that are not in any way on the horizon of the text itself there mm -hmm. are questions but not the questions of the bible the bible has much more important questions uh to discuss which are you know the the origin of the universe that its relation to god and its purpose and that purpose is the thing, really, uh, that we we should be focused on. I, I I'm not criti I'm not criticizing you for asking that question. I think it's a very interesting no, question. These are those things that I I really really <clears throat> think about and read about and and would like to understand. But I think I just have to be satisfied that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and and we can, we can. Sort of... If you don't know, then I don't. Well, it doesn't. That doesn't necessarily follow. Actually, but <laughs> there might be well, things that I I don't know, and then you could. I'll happily learn from any any of anybody, including all of you. But I think the important thing is that those are the questions that that kind of question is really a scientific question, and Genesis one is not a scientific text. It does it doesn't I... pretend to be because that sort of you know what we call science didn't exist. It just wasn't there. That kind of thinking didn't exist until the really the 18th century. What well, these are things were just a, a sub topic or branch of philosophy. And before that, it was none of those things. So, you know, it just in the, the, the whole of the old world of the Old Testament is is a, is a fabulously indifferent <laughs> to any of these questions, uh, which is why we can't, you know, we, we can just speculate and guess and spoke around. David. Yeah, um, I mentioned it briefly last week as well. Revelation 22, it seems to be like a, 
a parallel or a, a, a refulfillment of um, mm. Genesis 1 and 2. And it talks about the tree of life with 12 types of fruit, yielding fruit each month, and the leaves of the trees were the, for the healing of the nations. So, and, and then it goes on further to say that there is no more uh, light or lamp of, or sun in this new heaven and earth. And it just seems to be those same kind of questions arise. Well, you know, if there, if there is a physical, I don't know, physical leaves, you know, uh, and yet there's no sun or light, where is the light coming from? Yeah. And it said here that, that uh, God and the, and the Lamb, um, well, they're, they're on the throne, but it says um, they will need no, uh, no light, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And it, again, it's not because it's, we're not dealing with science here, but there seems to be a, a linkage between the beginning of creation and this new recreation. Yep, um, completely. And, and, I, and I just wonder in the first creation, is could God well be being himself the light until physical light came uh, into, into the world? It's, I'm only throwing a penny into the pond mm. and leaving it that. Well, I mean, it says God said, let there be light and there was light. It doesn't say God made the light or created the light. Uh, and some people, I mean, some people have, you know, if you read through Genesis 1 again, we see that <clears throat> there's um, let there be light in verse 3. And then verse 7, and there was light. In verse 6, we say, let there be an expanse. And verse 7 says, God made the expanse. Uh, but then there are other places God said, and it was so. So there is a kind of alteration between did God say or did God make? And some people have made heavy weather of that. You could t do that kind of say, God said, let there be light. And he's actually, it was so because it's the light that emanates from God. Um, and, and then elsewhere he makes things. Seems to me to be pushing that distinction a bit f too far. I mean, I did say, I, I did say last time and the time before, that Genesis 1 is at least as much about eschatology as it is about protology. That is, it's, it's as much to do with the way the the fu future from our pers perspective as it is about the past. It, it's about the fulfillment of all things, not just the origin of all things. And that I, I will sort of hopefully be uh, able to help you know demonstrate that as we go go through the text of how, how, how that becomes more and more the case as we go through through the days of creation but of course all <clears throat> all light and all life uh, does emanate from god and what we see in, in revelation 22 uh, you're quite right it, it's a deliberate echoing of but that link between there be no light or you know no lamp or silence is not so much to do with I, I would suggest about the first day of creation but about the fourth day as as we will see in a minute in a, in a, in a short while i hope Okay, but thank you for that uh, contribution. Let's read now. Uh, and, uh, oh, actually, just before we do read, uh, so day one ends with light and darkness, evening and morning, day and night. Um, <clears throat> Martin, Luther, I just share with you what Luther says at this point when we get, just before we move on to six, verse five. He, he deals, uh, he treats in the, um, the whole of this book, uh, uh, Genesis very very much like a, like um, both as a divine text but also very much as a human text written by somebody for some for you know for an audience and he says but basically at this point Moses being is being a little bit sort of offhand and doesn't doesn't sort of brushes over things so he doesn't bother to tell us about angel the creation of angels and the battle between good and evil and the fall of the angels and all that he's kind of implies he was writing for people who are unsophisticated and ed uneducated so he kept the things simple. Uh, you know, um, <clears throat> of course, we we confess in the creed, and we know from from the scripture God created all things, visible and invisible, and very much this Genesis one is very much uh, focused on the creation of the things visible, the invisible realities, the spiritual realm, and so on is really just given as a, given and assumed throughout the rest of scripture but it's not it, it's never really very carefully explained and a lot of the things that we think we know about angels and the fall and lucifer and all those things actually don't come from the bible at all but they come from other places uh some of them from uh jewish literature from the 
um, roughly roughly from the period of the New Testament. Some of it comes from actually pagan ideas which have been uh, have been kind of adopted into Christianity. So, for example, sometimes the devil is depicted like a sort of half goat, half man. Well, that comes straight from the Greek myth about Pan, the god the god Pan. Uh, then there are things that are are, are just uh, speculation uh, and 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 based on nothing really at all, except just you know um, lively imagination, put it that way. Um, <clears throat> but yes, yeah, so so uh, it's not so much that Genesis skips over things like the creation of the angels, but it is focused on the visible world, the world which we inhabit, as opposed to the rest and the rest of uh, God's creation, which is beyond, if you like, our di- our, our three di- three dimensions and, and our five senses. Now let's read. So, if we could read. Uh, Verses five, six, uh, sorry, six, seven, and eight. Just chapter two. Chapter one. We're still in chapter one, verses six, seven, and eight. Whoever gets there first. I will then. And God Thank said, you. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Thank you. What did the authorised version call the expanse? King James. Can you remember? Firmament. Yeah, the firmament. Uh, <clears throat> what does that actually mean? Uh, the it's not a particularly precise term in itself. In itself, I'm uh, told that it's it's sort of etymological. The root of the word comes from the idea of stretch. <laughs> Hence the idea of expand, something that's stretched out or expanded uh, over over a space or through space. Um, a spread out thing, if you like. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. An island? No, there's no land. Oh. So uh, and and it's to separate the waters from the waters, and what's the separation? Waters above and waters below. Yeah. So you've got this expanse, and there's you know that if you like, if imagine there's a body of water, and then you put something in the middle, and you st- separate out the things that are above and things that are uh, below. Now, one way that this has been understood. Uh, <clears throat> and has been explained is that this is really the old-fashioned view of uh, the world a bit like a snow dome where you have a flat earth and then you've got this dome over this over the over the flat earth and this flat earth is kind of floating in the middle of the sea and the edges the sea around there you know when you go to the you know you walk in any direction on earth eventually you will hit the sea and the idea is the world is like a like a round disc or 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 or, or a square bit of flat and, and you get to, and eventually get to water and it's just water from there on end um <clears throat> this is you know it's, it's um there, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, very malicious false things said about the medievals uh and and one of them is that when columbus set sail people thought that he was never going to come back because he was going to sail off the edge of the earth uh nobody in those in that time really believed that they didn't believe in a flat earth <clears throat> yeah, in in columbus's time at all but uh uh that's that's the idea so there's like this endless deep uh and and in in the midst of this there's this land like floating or standing on or sitting on pillars and uh, then there's a dome over and there's water on the outside which is why we have a blue sky of course we have blue sky because it's the same color as the sea and every now and then some of that leaks and uh, and, and and drips down and we get rain now mm. that particular viewpoint uh, that particular conception of the world did exist 
people did think like that uh, at various points in history. Um, and some of the language used in the Bible, and this is, I think, um, again, I don't want to belabor the point, but some of the language used in the Bible is language that was adopted and adapted from the surrounding and the prevailing culture. So we have things like windows of the heavens opening. We have the pillars of the earth, uh, that kind of uh, idea. Now, <clears throat> Um, that doesn't mean, first of all, that this is necessarily at all what this what is meant here, because the pillars of the earth don't exist in this passage at all. Uh, although it's possible that people who are reading this, you know, let's say uh, uh, around the time of Moses, might have in, indeed pictured things like that. Uh, but it's not. It, it doesn't. In a sense, that doesn't matter one way or the other at all because we are told very clearly what is really meant by this expanse, this firmament, and it's towards the sky. Now, the ESV says uh, God called the expanse heaven with a capital H. I think that's a mistake, because heaven with a capital H, generally speaking, uh, I mean, is, is uh, used in, in the Bible in modern English, mostly to refer to the dwelling place of God. I mean, the reason it's a capital H is because in the same way with day and night is kind of the proper name given to it. Uh, but the heaven here doesn't mean heaven as in the dwelling place of God, but specifically means the sky above. Now, again, most languages don't distinguish between those two concepts. The whole point of heaven as the dwelling place of God is that God dwells above, you know, kind of up up there, if you like. Um, and so both the term does double service, the word. In English, at some point, the word heaven became specialized and sky became a separate term and those two things mean different things. Here, I would argue it's very clear that the what is in view is the sky because into it are very, various things are placed into it as we go along. And therefore, we've got the waters that are above the sky immediately and the waters that are below. The waters that are below, obviously, are the waters in lakes, rivers, and the sea. And the waters that are above, well, what might, where might those be found? In the clouds. That's a, that's a good starting, starting point for finding water. So <clears throat> you could understand this if you have a uh, an ancient worldview that exists in, in the envisages of flat earth with a dome above it, etc., etc. You can read this passage and it fits it perfectly well, or you could read it with a different understanding of a round earth and so on, and it still works because it's not trying to give a descript. It's not it's not giving us a description of the shape of things. It's again we are talking about the process. Uh, which God is, um, uh, you know, by which God is uh, creating reality. Does anybody want to comment on that? Yes, please. Um, coming from a non-Lutheran background, one of the things that I've noticed when I read or hear Lutherans is the importance of water yeah. um, in salvation. Yeah. Uh, I must admit, it's, I find it fascinating because for about 30 years, I was in, an, I suppose, in a Pentecostal environment that didn't really think water was, it was just for drinking, you know, like this. Mm. But then um, to discover that God works through practical things like water. Um, is there a connection in this verse with salvation? Is this a start of a thread of thought? Yes. But that happens the next day. Oh, the next day, right. Okay. Yeah, that comes. Okay. We So far, we have just water. Mm -hmm. There is no land. There's just water. We already had the Spirit of God hovering above the waters. Now, God separates the waters. Starts, you know, I, 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 I mentioned the other day, uh, or the other time, about the kind of the process that we've got, the, uh, if you like, the, um, uh, the, the creating of things and the separation of things and then the adorning of things. So mm -hmm. things are first created, then they're separated out into their proper places, and then they are uh, adorned um, 
and we are at this point uh, verse one is creation uh, verses one and two really is, is about creation uh, the days one two and three are really giving us the process of separation separating light from darkness now we're separating the waters below from the waters above mm -hmm. they both have their functions you know the water above does one thing the water below does another thing now we know again if you want to think in very modern uh not you know in terms of modern knowledge we know that there's a very close link between the atmospheric water if you like and uh and uh the bodies of water on on the earth uh and we talk you know the the whole um uh, cycle of precipitation, you know, what, I can't remember what it's called, now, the water cycle that we learn about in geography, you know, the, the water evaporates and then precipitates and then it flows back into the, and so on. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, in their proper place, they're doing their own thing. So what happens in the atmosphere is distinct from what happens in a lake or in the sea. Uh, but so far, we've just separated the two kinds of water. And now we, we are about to start uh, to see a, another kind of separation. Now, one thing that's missing from this day is yeah. any any kind of judgment or pronounce, pronouncing. Go on, Mike. Can we just a uh, uh, comment before we leave that? Um, yeah, I'm just, people... I was going to say what I was going to say was that the one thing that we haven't got is that God doesn't make any judgment of. He doesn't call it good or bad. He doesn't say and it was good. He just he just was so. Uh, okay, yes. But God. Uh, regarding, regarding the water, some people speculate that the early earth was actually very different from the earth that we know now. And that originally there was an actual water canopy, not just in the form of water vapor as clouds are, but an actual canopy of water. Now, how it stayed up there, I don't know. But it, that would have meant that the early earth was much warmer, that atmospheric pressure was much higher, and that there was a, um, that climates across the earth were, were much more uniform, which would explain how, after the flood, that, that you had uh, uh, coal deposits being formed as far north as Svalbard, for example, or, or the, even in the, or in the Antarctic which are a testimony to, to, to this uh, much more uniform climate in an, in an early earth. Um, yeah, and the speculation is that there was an actual water canopy, which of course came down mm. in, in, in the flood. Yeah. I and have come of, across uh, that. I wasn't going to mention it, but now you did. So <laughs> now, we, now we have to talk about it. That was one of the... Um, partly explain why people lived so long because they were much better protected ag against all, all this radiation from space mm. which um which makes people age um, one among um, others yeah. you are you're absolutely right i've i have i've i've come across i came across that a long time ago that theory i've read a fair bit about it i have to say that on on its own terms it's very persuasive in the sense that it makes sense of various things, particularly in scripture, this mm -hmm. idea. Um, I think the main weakness of it is, is that is the fact that, as, as you, know, you said, is a speculation. It's very difficult to find. It's very, it's very difficult to demonstrate that it's, it's likely, it's possible. And I think we, we uh, there's there's an awful lot of things we should say we should there are many things about which we should never say it's not possible a lot of things are possible, uh, but uh, yeah I my my I feel like my my slight uh, personal skepticism about it is that the origin of that theory is one that uh, I think I have a methodological problem with the the desire to propagate the theory which is that is it's an attempt to make genesis one tally up with the current findings of science as closely as possible and for reasons i've already explained partly because that's not what genesis one has given us for partly because of the very uh impermanent nature of current scientific knowledge and the fact that it's constantly changing and altering with 
new theories and findings of what was absolute truth hundred years ago is complete falsehood today, and nothing to there's nothing to suggest that next hundred years will be any different. Um, I don't want to. Uh, at the very least, I say I wouldn't want to put too much weight on that. We can say, well, maybe that's that's possible, and if if that is the case. Yeah, it does make sense of a lot of things. And if let's say that one day scientists discovered, in fact, that that's exactly what it was. I mean, things like, I mean, it, it would certainly make other theories about why the Earth appears older than it actually is, if the Earth is actually quite young. It would make great sense of those things uh, in, in certain settings. And that's fine. And if that's the case, I, I'm, I'm not going to complain. But as uh, I said, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to sort of, uh, in any way suggest to anybody that that's the way we if if we understand the world that way then it all makes sense because then what we're doing is we're putting our understanding of the universe before the word of god as opposed to the other way around we should trust the word of god even if it doesn't make sense to us or we can't see how it fits that's that's but i'm not suggesting that that's what you're doing but i'm just explaining why, why i was going to skate over that in silence <clears throat> but thank you thank you for making me not to, not, um, to uh, stop stop there does anybody want to comment on that or ask anything about that well does that mean that the flood is caused by this water that was up there that's come down that's the suggestion that is the right. suggestion and then you know the, the flood would be uh, that kind uh, of water uh, kind uh, of uh, collapsing the, yes um there was water actually uh, more much more water than than now under the earth as well and it says something about uh, plants being being watered from underneath rather, rather than than now when it comes from above as rain mm. that there was springs of water and they opened up also well as actually the scriptural accounts of Noah's flood said the the, the something uh, the, the springs of the deep so there was a lot of water a lot of water under the earth as well yeah i mean we even now we have a huge amount of water uh under the earth and uh um you know they're, they're massive reservoirs of water and you, you can imagine if one of those burst open for any reason mm. you know the sahara mm. the sahara could be turned into a lake very quickly if the all the water underneath it all of a sudden came to the surface mm. yeah well it's you're... an artesian wells isn't it we're in we're in an area where there's an artesian well and that's where our water comes from is that right i i i wouldn't know i'm i'm i not, not not my area of expertise, I'm afraid, but I, I'm glad I'm glad you know something more more than I do about this. Um, we will get to the flood eventually. We, we we're going to go all the way through to chapter eleven, so we will discuss the flood when we get to it. And in fact, chapter two will raise some of those questions too. But for now, let's read on. Uh, and now we're going from verse nine to uh, verse thirteen. If somebody could read for us, please. And, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth was brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Right. So here comes the first, uh, oh, sorry, the next separation. What is that? That he's getting everything up from the ground now and started on working out what has will be needed for the future. But what, what's the things that have been separated? Waters in the heavens. Not what's in the heavens. Is water under the heavens from what? Land. Dry land, yes. So we've got the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. So the first time, this is the first mention of dry land. And God said it, and it was so. And the God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And now we have, and God saw that it was good. 
So it's the first, it was good here. So let's stop here uh, for a moment. What's so good about it? What does good mean here? That everything was worked out right and was growing as he wanted. So it was good. That means he's got it right. But he already got it right in the previous day when he separated the waters below and waters above and the day before that separating light and darks. But those weren't called good. Well, he was happy with what he'd done. And so he said so all the time. Uh, I, that makes sense in terms of the language, but that would then imply that he wasn't happy before. Or he's even happy that God's got it. So that's uh, your, I understand what you're saying, but that's, that's, uh, that's not the right tree to be barking up. But there wasn't a before, before there was an after. No, previous days of creation. Yeah. Days one and two, there's no, it was good. All right. There's no suggestion God kind of, kind of fluffed it up or it wasn't quite as, as he wanted it, but never mind. Can you, can you can remember from last, we, we discussed it, talked about this last week. Can anyone remember what does good mean here? Beautiful and beneficial. Thank you. Beautiful and beneficial. It's mm. good for mm. something. It's not just good mm. or in a kind of abstract sense. And it's beneficial. And as we will discover as we go along, it's for the for it's good for us. Mm. It's good for humans. It's good for people. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, we now begin to have not just things that exist, but we have conditions created that enable life on Earth by humans. <coughs> And it was good. Mm. And the first thing that is good is the retreat of water and the appearance of dry land. Mm. Um, now, the um, the dry land is given a name, which is Earth. Yeah. Earth. Land. Well, the whole the whole of the planet in, is called Earth. How did that come? Then? Well, it's in English it is, yes. But the word for Earth is Land. Land, yes. Eretz. And so this NIV is called called the dry ground land. And that's actually a better translation. Because the word the word Eretz, the Hebrew word. And I remember you mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago the um, uh, the name of the uh, the the kind of the biggest the the Israeli version kind of equivalent of the Times as the kind of the great the the uh, newspaper of record is Haaretz the land. And throughout the Old Testament, the question of the land, from beginning with Abraham becomes obviously the kind of a central concern it's about the the promised land land promised and this is by i mean if you want to understand uh try to understand rather i don't think anybody can fully understand but try to understand middle eastern politics and particularly the question of what's going on with israel and palestine one of the reasons why the israel palestine conflict won't go away hasn't gone away and won't go away and unless there's some seismic shift in something or other will never go away is because it's a question about land. There are lots of people in Israel who will <coughs> consistently build settlements in the Palestinian territories. They'll bring the build these compounds with the support of the Israeli military. Why do they do that? Why don't they just say, let's just stay on our side, they stay on their side and we can all live in peace. Why would you why would you go and insistently build a settlement and then bring your whole family and your neighbors and friends to live in the middle of hostile territory where you will have things thrown into your compound and people might even try to shoot you when it'd be so much easier just to stay on your side of the wall. Why do they do it? Because they think it's their land. Why do you think, why do you think it's their land? I mean, they, they, it's not like they were driven from it. They, they were promised that land though, weren't they? By the, by? By the Lord. Who? God promised them the land. It's, it's based on the promise the description of the boundaries of Israel in the Old Testament. And so they believe that since this is given by God in the Holy Scriptures, it's mm -hmm. theirs. Yeah. And therefore, when they go, you know, if they don't build settlements, they're actually being unfaithful to God and unfaithful to his promises because they're not taking possession of the land that was given to them to possess. 
the Palestinians don't like it very much for some reason. <laughs> and then they have hence conflict and, you know, it's not likely to go away anytime soon. Um, it makes the whole Northern Irish question look like a walk in the park by comparison, because at least the Northern Irish land isn't promised in the Bible. Right? It's just, there's more recent history. So it's about the land. Now, I'm not suggesting here that the only thing that cropped up in the uh, from the sea was the promised land and everything else was just water. But that's the focus. That's the that's what that term, that word is leading the if you like the reader to think of. Rather than <clears throat> just kind of general conceptions of the planet or the earth or, or you know, all, all, all the land in the world. Because who cares about all the land in the world, really? I mean, I, I have never lost sleep or got upset because there might be a lawn somewhere in the middle of the, in, in southern Canada that isn't mown. It's my own lawn that I really worry about. And in the same way, for most people, especially at a time when, the, you know, before satellite communications and, and, and electronic communication in general, you know, you could go through your whole life and not necessarily know that there's much of a world beyond the two villages down the road. Mm. And so when the scripture says, and God called the dry land or the dry ground, um, land, it kind of immediately sets off certain bells ringing in the, in the ears of anybody who is, knowledgeable about the promise of a land and and you know the earliest possible author earliest suggested author for this writing is moses and moses comes four and a half centuries after the promised abraham so the promised land had existed as a concept already for a long time by the time of moses and if the if this was written later then it becomes all the more so because then we've got the conquest of the promised land as well so we are already beginning to see that the, if you like, the, the, the text is not just about what happened in the past, but it's also telling, setting up an expectation of things to come. Because as I said a few weeks ago, Genesis really is the historic, historical preamble to the giving of the law. And Genesis 1 is like the kind of the, the introduction of the preface to that historic preamble. We set the scene for everything else. So that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is that the thing that is first thing is that is proclaimed good is the retreat of water and the appearance of dry land. The retreating of water and the appearance of dry land is called good. Now. If again. We think of Genesis 1 as setting up expectations of future things. What future things come to mind about the retreat of water and the appearance of dry land as being good? Well, it had to be good because this would start off life. No, I, I, mean, I mean a different question. What I mean is, is, is there, can you think of anything that happens later on in the Torah, in the books of Moses, where we see this being played out. That the Israelites, the Israelites going through the Red Sea. Thank you. When Israel was pinned between the armies of Pharaoh and the Red Sea, God sent an east wind and it made the water to retreat and a dry land mm -hmm. appeared. And that was the path to salvation. That's what stood between them and the promise. The promise of the inheritance of the land and life. Any others? Flood. The flood came to an end when the water retreated and dry land reappeared. And life Joshua. was gone. All right. Um, Joshua gone over the Jordan. The river Jordan. The water retreats. Water in this case is held back. The water is held back. And what used to be the River Jordan is now dry land so that Israel can cross into the promised land on dry ground. So you can see that this is this retreating of water so that dry land might appear. Not only did it happen, but it sets up a particular way in which God 
works to bring salvation. So this is it becomes the pattern or to use a posh word, the archetype, if you like, it's an archetypal event that sets up the way that patterns will be repeated and things will happen again and again as things uh, as as salvation <clears throat> kind of is worked out by God for his people. In the same way, by the way, if we take the whole thing in reverse, the uh, return of water onto dry land is a favorite, uh, if you like, God, one of the ways in which God pronounces judgment. So when God regrets his creation because of the wickedness of the earth, he lets the waters to return and to cover the dry ground. Dry ground disappears. Noah is given, Noah and his family and the animals and the, are given their own floating bit of dry land. They're kind of little wooden made island that floats on top of the waters. But the water itself, the return of the water is judgment. Likewise, the waters return into the Red Sea as judgment on Pharaoh and the army of Pharaoh is drowned. And of course, the... Uh, I mean, in in a slightly more removed way, the 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 blessing for Israel in the withholding of the waters of Jordan was not such a blessing for the people of Jericho. Mm. And why did God allow the people of Canaan to be destroyed, or why did He command them to be destroyed? Because of their wickedness. It's His judgment. It was God's judgment. It wasn't just a kind of, you know, we're going to kill them so you can have this land. No, God had run out of patience with their wickedness. And this takes us, David, to your question about water. Um, there is in um, in the uh, Lutheran order of baptism, there's a prayer that was uh, composed for the baptism service uh, by Martin Luther, which is often referred to as the flood prayer. It's made its way in a modified form, actually, into the Church of England's baptismal service as well. But it goes like this. Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemn the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserve believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his hosts in the Red Sea, yet led your people Israel through the, the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold this person according to your boundless mercy and bless him with true faith in the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood, all sin in him which has been inherited from Adam and which he has committed sins would be drowned and die. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, he would be declared worthy of eternal life. Mm -hmm. And there you see the dual, the, you know, the two thing, two ways in which God uses water. The same water, if you like, God if you like manipulates water to save and to punish, to redeem and to condemn. And it's not two different waters, but the same thing. And this already, I mean, this, this sets up, if you like, if you want to kind of trace it right back, this sets up the logic of the flood later on. The flood is, is a reversal of the third day of creation. Or third, fourth and fifth. Uh, a third, a third to the sixth days of creation, really. Um, third, fifth, and sixth days of creation are are reversed by the flood. But then we are told by, for example, Peter in his first letter that the flood really was there to prefigure baptism. That just as God used water to pronounce judgment, and to separate, if you like, water from dry land and lifelessness and life the possibility of life for mankind and the impossibility of life for mankind in the same way at the flood he did the same so the same water that drowned the world also upheld the ark and therefore sustained Noah. now the same water drowns and judges and condemns our sins by uh, 
assigning them to the cross of Jesus, but at the same time, the same word upholds us until we are brought to the dry land into the new heaven and the new earth. And as, as a keen sailor, this grieves me very much, but in the book of Revelation says that there is no more sea in the new creation. So it's just all dry land now in the new creation, apart from the river of life. So um, baptism then, is that then uh, a drowning of the old man, old sins, mm -hmm. and also secondly, upholding? Um, yeah, but what does upholding mean? You are, well, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> 1 Peter 3 talks, you know, that the water, you know, God, God drowned the world and, and, and uh, except for Noah, you know, the ark and uh, with Noah and eight souls and his family or eight souls and all. In the same way, baptism now saves you. Just like the water of the flood saved Noah by upholding the ark. So the very often in Christian tradition, the, the ark has become then the, if you like, a, a, a symbol of the church. That just like the world was drowned, but the ark kept the believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all, in safety. In the same way, while the world is drowning in sin, you know, baptism brings you into the into the church, which then holds you safe uh, from the judgment and condemnation of God. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it's really the body of Christ that is the ark. Okay. So by the same water, we are being brought from death into life from life on our own to life as members of the body of Christ. And therefore, there is, it's a separation of light and darkness. You know, the, these things converge. So, I mean, I would argue, and I'm, I'm not alone in making this argument, and it's not, it's not even a thought, of, you know, certainly not original to me, but that if you really, 1 Peter, th the whole letter, first letter of Peter really is, a, if you like, an extended meditation on the significance of baptism. What has happened? What ha what, you know what when we are baptized what does that mean you if you just try reading try reading through one peter beginning to end and think what's this got to do with baptism ask that question at every paragraph every every new section and you, you would be amazed it's there all the way through now um, <clears throat> therefore what you see there is all these images creation images are being brought to the light so what you know we are being brought out of darkness into his marvelous light where do we first encounter darkness and light and we are being brought you know we have been saved by water just as Noah was saved by water um, where do we first encounter that idea when that we're water, baptized well that in baptism but the first you know the first encounter of it is in fact here separation of water uh, from dry land uh, as an act of God that is the first act of God that is described as good beneficial and beautiful uh, and so on and so on and then we all then we discover things as we uh, we're about to find out about the fourth day <clears throat> and i will if i give you a little spoiler here is that we are we are uh, by this act of you know being brought out of darkness into light has made us holy priests royal priesthood and we are about to discover where that came from but we're not born yet we're not here. We're not on the earth, are we? No, but the, no, not yet there. But this is, if you like, what, what this passage is doing is setting it all up so that when it happens, it's like we can see, A, these things are possible. But more than that, the way in which God operates and functions in salvation is directly drawn out of the way that he operates and functions in creation. And this is a, I mean, this is important on, on lots of different grounds. I wasn't going to go here, but since Avril, you you brought it up, you uh, I, I'm going to take this little detour as well. Um, and I'm not I'm not upset. I was just going to spare you, but now sorry, it's all Avril's fault. Uh, it's very easy and very tempting often for us to think of creation and salvation as two completely disconnected things. Worse still, it's not uncommon at all. It's completely unbiblical and unchristian, but very common amongst Christians. Essentially, to think of salvation as being a redemption from creation. When every time you see people release balloons at a funeral, 
by the way, if 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 you're at your funeral, you ask people to release balloons, I will walk out. So be forewarned. It won't happen. I wouldn't allow it. Uh, the idea of being there, we are somehow kind of, you know, it's like the a, a picture of a soul soul being released and, and floating up to the skies and all that kind of business. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that's the or, original thinking behind cremation as well. That you, you kind of release the soul from this bondage to the body. These things are, these these ideas that somehow creation, that we are escaping from the earth and we're escaping from creation by salvation, that really it's, you know, the, the old pie in the sky when you die kind of idea is what salvation is all about, is not Christian. It's not biblical. What the Bible speaks of is God creating the world and behold, it was very good. The corruption of the world is not because it's the world, it's because it's corrupt, because of sin. And what salvation consists of is the restoration of creation. That's why we are told, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, says, you know, we, you know, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Oh, we speak of baptism being a regeneration, which means both new birth, but it also means new creation, recreation. That, we, that, that word can mean both things. And that in Christ, creation is restored and renewed. And that's why, for example, when Christ is raised from the dead, he comes back bodily, he's resurrected. He doesn't leave a lifeless body behind and come and start appearing as a ghost. When they think the disciples think he's a ghost, they say, well, give me something to eat. And he eats in front of them to demonstrate that he is actually flesh and blood. And he's, But he is not subject to death. So his creation, his body is a restored uh, first, if you like, first fruit of the new creation. And that's why it speaks of a new heaven and a new earth, rather than, you know, escaping from earth to heaven. I mean, I, I didn't, I used to kind of complain, at least in my mind, about every time we talk about going to heaven, because it's not really very accurate, because we don't go to heaven, we go into the new creation, which is heaven new heaven and new earth new sky new new land if you like um i've given up on that because we all yeah, as long as we know what we mean by that that's fine but what we mean by that is not that we float up from the earth into the sky uh and and sit on clouds uh in in some kind of in in, in sort of um uh bodiless kind of floating souls kind of state <clears throat> or that we become angels or some such nonsense but rather that we are resurrected and we are given new body, you know, uh, our bodies are renewed uh, after the likeness of Christ in immortality and incorruptibility. Read 1 Corinthians 15 for the details. And therefore we find that all that is, all that is, everything that happens in the Bible from verse 4 of Genesis 2 onwards is built on what happens in Genesis chapter 1. And that's, I mean, just to repeat myself again, uh, this is why getting kind of um, ourselves waylaid by or going, you know, kind of pinned down by questions about the relation between current findings of uh, modern science and Genesis 1 and trying to marry the two together or set them into battle against each other is a tremendous missed opportunity. Because it take, gets us all fighting in the footnotes and we ignore the actual text. And the text has got something far, far, far more important to say, which is about the whole God, God's, all of God's intention for us. So, yes, creation, by the time humans are on the seed, is ready for God's goodness to be displayed and to be played out. And the whole story of from the fall onwards is how that goodness is lost and how God comes back again and again and again and again to restore that goodness. And it's done fully in our Lord Jesus Christ and through him, then in all who believe in him. And that's why it's so important that we kind of have, we, we, we don't read this as a simply as a, as a kind of text on its own, but we con constantly ask ourselves, what does this lead us to expect hereafter? I don't mean hereafter as in after this life, but uh, after this chapter. What is it preparing us for? And it's preparing us for everything. In this particular case, water and dry land as the first thing that is really good. 
that is that is first thing that is, is specifically for our benefit as humans. So thank you, everyone, for bowling. I gladly bat it. Does anybody like to uh, respond to that, or should we move on? Well, let's move on then, since there's stunned silence. Uh, and uh, the second half, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. First of all, you see that act of separation, each according to its kind all, all the time. So it's not just, it doesn't just say there was lots of vegetation, but there were different kinds and, and each in its own kind. What do these plants here, or the things that are growing on earth, what do they have in common? Think again. Remember, they're called good. Earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So if God saw that it was good, what does that tell us? It's complete. It's what does good mean? Good. Beautiful and beneficial. Thank you. It's beneficial for us. What kind of plants are being listed here? Vegetation. But specific. Have a look at very very detail. All sorts, isn't it? Fruit trees, fruit, and seed yielding plants. It says. Mm. Now it doesn't say so specifically, but again, the focus here is on things that are edible. It doesn't mention pine trees and fir trees. It mentions sprouts in verse verse eleven. Mm, don't like them. No, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> in the before the fall, everything tasted good to everybody. Okay, uh, that if you don't like sprouts, that's because of your sin. How about that? <laughs> this message was brought to you by the sprout farmers of Britain. Um, so again, the focus here is is not just on vegetation in general, but immediately the focus turns to seeds and fruit. Uh, which kind of puts us into the into the world of plants as food, nourishment, nutrition. And again, this it's not made explicit here, but we see this later on as we go along the story. All of a sudden, these plants get a mention again, and they are now performing a function, and that function is to feed. Such so barley and corn and things like that. Uh, doesn't say specifically, but obviously uh, we eat. I mean, whether you're a farming uh, kind of agrarian society or a hunter-gatherer society, you know, any kind of ancient society, the thing that we mostly eat, we don't eat, we don't tend to eat things that are grasses. Uh, but we tend to eat the things that grow uh, from plants. So we eat, tend to eat seeds and fruits. If you're eating, if you're farming barley or wheat, you're eating the seeds. If you're a fruit farmer, you're eating the, you're obviously growing the, the fruit. We don't eat apple trees. And we don't eat the stalks of wheat or, or rye, just the seeds. Mm. And so we are, again, it was good because now life, human life is possible. The, the scene is being set. And of course, as we will just about to find out, as we're just about to find out, these things come in season. I and mean, again, we've got a reference to uh, Revelation 22, where we have the tree of life, which produces 12 kinds of fruit throughout the year it's all one season but in the world plants that are harvested whether it's fruit of uh, vines for example in front of grape or the the seeds of wheat that we eat um, these are they they come in season and those Is, seasons are important david yeah just when you mention the word seed and fruit they seem to be quite very important words as we 
go through the scriptures. Is there is there a connection? Do you think, or am I just stretching it too much? Tell me first what the importance is. The seed. Um, is, well, I think of Christ, uh, and I think of the promises. The you know that. You know, um, is, it, is it Genesis three? That, you know, your seed will. Just got it. Um, yeah, I should know where it is. But yeah, the seed of the woman. Yeah, yeah the seed of the yeah. woman. Yeah, that one. And then yeah. the fruit, obviously, the fruit of the spirit. And they have the seed of Abraham uh, as well. Yes, I would say this. I mean, those things, they are there. And it's the same word. Mm -hmm. And this is one of my uh, one of my big complaints with the ESV, which we generally speaking use, uh, is that it translates the word seed as offspring every time it refers to humans. And it therefore vanishes that distinction. It's very much contrary to their own translation philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so every time it happens, I'm going to complain. So you, you are forewarned again. Uh, but yes, I mean, it's, it's secondary in a sense. It's not direct. But again, we have the, the, the word seed. It's repeated. Plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed. Verse 11, verse 12. Plants yielding seed according to their own kinds and true trees bearing fruit in which is their seed according to its kind. It's a repetition. Um, so again, yes, it's it's not. You've noticed it. So it must be there. Mm. And you won't have been the first person to notice that link. So it's kind of, it's, if you pardon the pun, it's planting a seed uh, into yeah. a reading of the, uh, of the rest. Yeah. One other thing to note, though, verse 12. Where did this vegetation, how did this vegetation come about? What's he saying, verse 12? Well, the, the earth brought forth vegetation, the land. Right. So the earth or the land brought forth uh vegetation any comments on that it doesn't make you think anything after the water had receded it left the means for the seed to grow on the ground but why why am i drawing attention to it read my mind why am i asking to asking you to think about it because it's a very important part of how it became the seeds usually come from a parent and obviously it's showing that the seed comes before mm. right <laughs> there's something about it though think about how it comes how it comes about have a look well, it says according to their kinds. So no, but no, or even before, not not in what what manner, but what is the method by which plants appear? If they're put there by someone, so they grow. No, it doesn't say that. Does it say in verse twelve? The earth brought forth the vegetation. Exactly, the earth brought forth vegetation. Now, why am I? Why am I? drawing attention to that um, the seeds were not there first there's something Although, more fundamental than that sorry. sorry something more fundamental than that oh. mm -hmm. it's the first thing that appears that we're not told that god made it happen directly uh -huh. the land is there and the earth brought forth vegetation it's the work of god god said let there be you know let the earth sprout vegetation and the earth brought for vegetation. It's by God's command, but it's the actual earth that brings about this vegetation. Because God well, just made when it. we plant anything, the earth makes it grow. So no, it does. Yes, but we don't have here. We, there is no planting here. We're not told that God God planted seed in the ground and it started, but God made it. So there is, a, if you like, there is a certain um, indirectness, if you like. This is a thing that's indirectly created. It's, a, it's like a feature of the earth. That God, God in a sense, um, imbues the earth with this this characteristic of producing, or, or this uh, the, the the production of 
uh, vegetation. Because that's not the point. The, the goodness of this is not in the fact that it exists. The goodness is in what it exists for. God is, you know, it's almost it's almost like God is kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit silly here, but it's almost like God is kind of delegating this task to his creation. It's a second second hand production. Let's read the next day. So we've got now verses uh, fourteen uh, to nineteen. Who's next? I can do it. You. And God said, "Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens." to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years mm -hmm. and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. Thank you. Okay, now we have an obvious problem here in the text. Every... Where it says years. Sorry? Years. It says that there are years there, so it's things that are taking longer to grow. No, and that doesn't mean that the day was twenty-four hours. No, no, it's it's, it's four days. It doesn't mean it took that long. It says for the per the four here means for the purpose of. Um, that's that's the, that's the point. Hello. Um. Every armchair atheist likes to point out this. About the fourth day. It's about the, um, it's not really, in a sense, two great lights. There's technically only one great light, which is the sun. Are they referring that the moon is a light or night? There's an even bigger problem, which is that we already had light created on the first day. But sun, moon, and the stars only appear. The sources of light that we know of appear on the fourth day. But and the Ed, earlier light was God's light. We do, we're not told that. Well, oh. That's what we talked about earlier. We're not told that. We're not told what the light is. Um, and we have vegetation kind of being sprouting from the earth before there's light. Now, of course, um, in it, we all know that you know seeds germinate in the darkness and that's absolutely fine but the the whole idea that you know since the ancient world people have had a problem with this how can we have sun, a light being created on day one but sun created on day four given that the light that reaches the earth is almost exclusively uh, from the sun uh, either, either directly or indirectly through the moon and the rest of the light comes from the stars, uh, which are also created in day four. I don't know. I don't know how many of you have had the experience in our very light polluted uh, world that we these, these days live in. But if you're in a place where there's no light pollution and you get a starry sky, it's amazing how much light you can actually get from uh, from them. But you can see the problem, and there are again there are various explanations of it. Uh, one is to say that there is uh, the I, I was looking at what, about some some of the early church fathers how they explain this uh, because obviously they didn't share our uh, sort of uh, assumptions about uh, how the sun sun and the stars work and how they produce light. So uh, I came across one particular church father, for example, who suggested that God created light on the first day and then on the fourth day he placed it in the sun. So on the fourth day, kind of, he created the sun and said, "Okay, now the light is there, comes from there." Now, obviously, if if modern physics is correct, then that's a that's that's not a very good explanation because the sun doesn't 
the light of the sun is not borrowed in that sense, but rather it emanates from itself through the process of nuclear fusion. Um, another explanation is to say, actually, this is a slight misreading of the text. That when it says, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night is really a slight mistranslation. It sounds very similar in Hebrew to the let there be light, let the earth sprout vegetation, but it's not quite the same grammatically. So what it really is saying is that let the lights in the expanse of the heavens be, the, be for the separation of the day from the night. Um, Would the sun have exploded and made it? On, let, let, let me just finish. Sorry, I was just uh, taking taking breath. So I'll come back to you in a minute. So, so okay. the idea there is that it, what it's doing is that it is, uh, it's not so much describing, saying that the sun and the moon and the stars were created. On the fourth day, but that they their purpose was given on the fourth day. Uh, which, is quite a clever explanation. You can, I think, you can make the grammar do that job. I've never ever seen this particular translation anywhere except in this in this book that makes the suggestion, uh, which just, which sounds to me like it's not as convincing an explanation as he thinks it is, and and it's more likely to come across as being being an a, an attempt to get away from the quandary, trying to trying to avoid the problem by saying maybe it's not maybe maybe uh, maybe the problem is other people, <laughs> you know, people have read it wrong. But if you're the only person who reads it correctly and everybody else reads it wrong, it could be that maybe you're the problem after all. Um, again, obviously, there are lots of Christians who don't hold Genesis 1 to be a literal account of six days. And the moment you do that, of course, the problem goes away because then you're not dealing with uh, it all happened in six days specifically in this order, but rather the point is that, uh, you know, if you like the, the, the ordering of the days of creation is given for, uh, you know, for this, for some other reasons, theological or literary or symmetrical reasons. And obviously then there is no problem if you, if you take it that way. Again, I'm not going to answer that with a definitive answer, uh, because, you know, there are, there are a, a good and and uh, pious reasons for holding different views, all of which can be do justice to the scriptures. And uh, again, I don't want to suggest to you that there is just the one, the way that I think about it is the correct way. Um, and, and therefore you, you're free in good conscience to hold, hold different views. I would say this instead, that that question is not, uh, is not the central point of the fourth day at all. It's a sort of, it's a, it's a sort of head scratch by us. But whether or, whether or not the sun and the moon and the stars were created on the fourth day, regardless of that question, there are two things that these verses emphasize for us. One is really, really obvious. It's so obvious that, we, you know, if I asked you to spot it, you would, wouldn't necessarily comment on it, which is that the sun and the moon and the stars were created. I say, we, we might think, well, obviously they were created but <coughs> if you are reading this in the second millennium bc it's not in the least bit obvious in a very large number of the world's pagan religions through history the celestial bodies sun moon and stars have in fact been seen as divine in themselves i mean why do we have saturday why is Saturday called Saturday? After Saturn. Yeah, why is Sunday planet. called Sunday? After the sun. Yes, two divinities in the Roman religion, from where we get the, the names of our week. And Monday, you'll never guess who gave the name to Monday. Nope. Anyone? Who was it? It's Day of the Moon. Monday, oh. Sunday, day of the sun, and then you go Saturn, day of Sat Saturday, so day of Saturn. They were held to be divinities, and because 
you know, it doesn't take a huge amount of uh, experience or huge amount of technical and scientific knowledge to realize that all life depends on the sun. They were therefore, you know, the sun was therefore seen as a source of life and therefore divine being. And therefore, in many, many pagan religions, the, 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 the chief of the gods was often related to the sun. And now this Bible comes along and says, OK, God created the sun and moon and the stars on day four. <laughs> they weren't even the top of the list. They could wait till day four. We could go without them until then. Because after all, things can germinate quite nicely. Thank you very much. Without the sun, we we'll call. Well, you know, you, they, they are created when they're when they're strictly needed. Now that's not. You know, that's part of the kind of. There's a sort of, if you like, an apologetic or a kind of like an, a criticism of pagan religion involved here. And it's again a, a there to say that not, nothing is eternal other than God Himself. Secondly. Uh, and and perhaps more importantly for those who are in fact who believe in God's word, and so that's if you like directed out out outwards, and and is to shield us against any temptation to to join others in in the worship of creation. Um, is the um, is that purpose, and whether or not the um, you know whether or not you follow the the opinion that I I tell, told you earlier that what this is this passage is not saying that the sun and moon and the stars were created on the fourth day but on the fourth day they were given their purpose. Regardless of that, these verses speak primarily of the purpose, rather than the cre actual creation of the sun and the moon and the stars. And we see this because it's it's very repetitive. Things are said twice. This, uh, if if you like, if if you are into technical terminology and 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 uh, words of, of foreign origin, this sort of structure of text is called a chiasm, a chiasm from the Greek word chi, which is a shape of an X. So it goes in and out. Where you begin, you say something, and you say something else. You say, you know, say thing A, and then thing thing B, and then thing C, and then second half of the text you go C B A. So you say something in one order, and then the reverse order. That's called a chiasm, and this is a chiasm. <clears throat> what is the purpose of these lights in the expanse of the sky, the heavens? To rule over the day and the night. To rule over the day and the night, and already in verse, so that's the that's the second repetition of the sea. That's the third thing. What's what about in verse fourteen? Separate the day from the night. And then. Let them be. For signs and for seasons, and for days and years. Thank you. Signs and seasons, says, uh, and for seasons, for days and years. Right. Now, there's a slightly obscure word. The NIV translates slightly less obscurely as let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. Again, the focus here is the, 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 the proper focus is a long term focus. Think again of the law of the Torah of Moses, or of God's Torah given given through Moses, the instruction that God gives through Moses. Let's do, uh, let's begin with days. Distinction of days. Is there anything in the law of Moses that talks about the distinction of days? That you have to keep the Sunday keep and not what? work on Sunday. Not Sunday. Sabbath. Sabbath day. Okay. Sabbath so, day. Yeah. So you have the distinction. You, there are six days. I've got six days of creation. And the seventh day is holy. And so therefore you have the Sabbath day, which is a day that is sanctified. It's a holy day mm -hmm. and a day of rest. Mm -hmm. You can only do that if you know when one day starts and another one ends. 
And so from the very beginning of creation, we're told evening and morning, first day, evening and morning, second day, evening and morning, third day, evening, and morning, fourth day. And by the way, you do this by the sun and the moon and the stars. Sun, so the sun marks days. What about years? What's there about years in the law of Moses? Any laws about years? There's the Sabbath year. So the seventh year when you when things lie fallow. And then when you get a Sabbath of Sabbaths, seven years time, a seven lots of seven years comes the year of Jubilee. What happens in the year of Jubilee? anyone recall all debts are forgiven and all slaves are released hmm. now we are talking about a holy day and a day of rest and then we talk about the release of prisoners and slaves and and and, and the payment of debts does that remind you of anything or anyone Christ. yes Jesus is our jubilee. And he is our Sabbath rest. In him we are made holy. So already this is pointing to the coming of Jesus, but through intermediary steps. You can only have, you know, you can only mark days and years if you have a son. And the moon is that uh, in in again in Old Testament biblical thinking the moon is there to mark months. That's what you know. Biblical mm. months are lunar months, not not solar months. Mm. Each cycle of the moon. Can you think of any special months in the uh, Old Testament? Harvest moon. Not moon month. Any special months? specifically that are any month that is, is singled out well december when christ was born but that wasn't sure mm. it was. that's that's roman that's roman month i'm gonna talk about old testament law oh. what happened in the first month on the 14th day exodus uh, it's the first month of the year. On the fourteenth day is the harv. It was the beginning of the Exodus, and that was marked every year. And that begins, if you like, that's the first month, and then from that you begin to count other things. Fifty days from uh, the Passover comes Pentecost, and the Pentecost was. In the Old Testament was a harvest festival. So you get all the main festivals of the uh, Old Testament year, the calendar. They're all mar marked by the moon. You've got the first month itself, uh, which gives us the Passover. Then you've got the first harvest and the second harvest. And then you've got the, uh, the you've got the Day of Atonement and all of these things are marked by seasons. And so the whole worship of Israel consists of a weekly cycle of days and an annual cycle of months and different festivals in different months, depending on the essentially the, the phases and the rotation of the earth and the sun and the moon. And so what's really being set up here is the whole way of timekeeping both in the short and in the long run, by which Israel is now going to live a life of worship before God. So where did this whole thing, you know, if you say, if you have, if, you know, if you're giving this account to the Israelites, the Israelites say, where did this, all this stuff come from? Why do we have days? And why do you have, why are there six days? And then the seventh days rest? Why do we have all these months? Why does this, month? and the answer isn't some kind of mythological, you know, that, you know, some, some primeval, primeval, primeval fog lay and laid an egg and kicked by accident or some other story that, you know, kind of everybody knows is nonsense by kind of gives us a nice story to remember facts by. He said, no, actually God created the world in such a way that we can observe his law 
that we can observe the whole pattern of worship because the whole pattern of worship is about us drawing near to God where our creator God comes and draws near to us and we draw near to him so that he might restore us and strengthen us, restore us, refresh us. So the Passover is about release from captivity. Then you've got all the harvest festivals, which are all fulfillment of the third day of creation. It's about enjoying the fruit of the land, which God has given. So every time you have a harvest, what do you do? You have a festival where you give the tithes, the first, temp, you know, the, the first fruits of your harvest, you give to God. You return it to God as an acknowledgement that it came from him. What do you mean he came from me? Well, he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. On the third day of creation, he made the plant, uh, the, the earth produce all these edible plants. Both the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, cereal plants that we in the first harvest and then the fruits of the earth, uh, which are the second harvest. And so the whole of the worship life, the, the, the cycle of festivals, the pilgrim festivals and the lesser festivals of Israel are all there to root the worship of Israel in creation itself. They're not at haphazard, or oh, let's just do it this way because it just happens to fit this or that sort of thing. It's not uh, pragmatic. It's there to constantly remind everyone, God made you. God made the world and he made the world for you. And that's why we have the fourth day. That's why we have the sun and the moon and the stars. They're not there because they are gods. They're not there so that we can read our horoscopes and or to guide our fate. They are there so that we can mark times and days and seasons and therefore be constantly rooted into the creation, into uh, uh, God's created goodness by drawing near to God himself. And this gives us, I mean, there's a thing whole thing that if you, if you go to the wrong kinds of meetings these days christian meetings you hear people talk about green theology and how we must be you know our, our concern must be with uh, with issues green and and, and the planet now uh, there's a right and the wrong way of going about it and that and an awful lot of it's been done all, all wrong but of course as i said earlier salvation does not remove us from creation but it actually roots us in creation if you want to be more rooted to creation, you need to be seek salvation. And salvation itself draws us to creation. So, David, you asked earlier about water. I mean, that's kind of the fundamental aspect of, 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 uh, of creation that makes life possible. And so when we begin to appreciate how God uses water in our salvation, specifically in holy baptism, then that begins to draw us back to where, you know, we, it makes us think of reevaluate the whole business of what water is in a far more profound way than just to say, can we find some water, traces of water on Mars to find out whether any bacteria ever lived there? Well, that's kind of interesting if you're into that kind of thing, but it's hardly, you know, earth shattering. If bacteria existed on Mars a, a million years ago, so what? You know, it doesn't change the price of milk or, or the way that my day is going to go today. But if water is the vessel by which God gives us life, not just earthly life for now, but eternal life. Well, that now we're talking about something entirely different. And likewise, when we see the sunrise in the morning, we can just not just say, oh, it's another day, but say, God, my goodness, God continues to let his sun rise on the evil and the just. Because this is a sign, this is, it was given for us so that we can mark each day as given by God, and particularly to keep count of days so that we know to worship him. So again, the focus is constantly building the foundation, building the, 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 the plinth, if you like, on which then the law of God and the, all the give in the word of God and the rest of our relationship with God and how we relate to him, he raised us, is, is, is established. which brings us to nearly three o'clock and also to uh, the end of the fourth day. Notice finally at the end of verse 18, God saw that it was good. So here we see again, this, is, this has human 
humanity, God's, God's uh, ultimate creation, humanity in view. This is for our benefit. Every time you see that, this was done for our benefit. <coughs> Good. We got through more than a dozen verses this time. We're about a dozen verses this time, which is uh, great progress. We'll get to the end of Genesis before Christmas at this rate. Uh, Genesis 1 before, uh, before Christmas at this rate. Um, <coughs> <laughs> which is uh, very encouraging indeed um any has anyone got any final questions or uh or comments or observations about any of this well i just think that we worship god every day so we don't <laughs> we did sort of say we know what day we worship god well let me rephrase that <laughs> that's yeah. okay i'm just uh... That there's a, there is a day that is given for worship. And there's a distinction between our daily worship of God in our ordinary lives and the kind of worship of God, which is in, in, involves us receiving the gifts of his grace in a specific way in his word and sacraments. They're not rivals, but they're not the same thing. So my, my doing everything to the glory of God. So if I'm mowing the lawn or painting the house, or, or or delivering uh delivering a uh, post or whatever it is i do to the glory of god that is a form of worship but that's not the same thing as my hearing god's word receiving the body and blood of christ or even praying with the with the church and there's two things there you know the, the everyday worship flows out of the the, the the life the exclusive worship it's it's an outworking of Any other comments, any, any questions remaining? No, nope. let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and the goodness of the creation in which you have given to us. We thank you for our lives and for all the things with which you have filled our lives and especially the blessings of your kingdom and our membership in it. Thank you for our inheritance with Jesus Christ in all the riches of your grace. Grant us always to live in the knowledge that you are our father, that you are our children, that in all that we say and do and think, we would uh, give you glory, bring benefit and, and uh, the goodness of your love to our neighbours and always be drawn closer and closer to you, to you through faith in Jesus Christ. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Amen.